Well, good afternoon, everyone. Greetings again to those of you who have joined us in the room. Everyone's so happy and so festive today. <laughs> and greetings to those of you who have joined us online. It's, uh, it's always great that we can uh, that we can uh, oh that we can broadcast out um, so that we can come to you right in your home. You know, especially with all that's going on in the world. Uh, what an absolute blessing. Um, I did want to say this lamp. This lamp is uh, was brought all the way from Cape Cod from my brother Brad. He went out last week, he and his family, went out for a week vacation out there, uh, Plymouth and Plymouth Rock area, um, and seen some of the, the the sites of early America, which I was kind of jealous, because that's kind of, a, that's, it's pretty cool, colonial America. Um, so this, he brought me this lamp, I watched his dog for him, um, <laughs> and he brought me, he knows I love oil lamps, so does he. And uh, he brought this back for me, so I thought what better place than to put it right here and have its light shine uh, for everybody to enjoy. So we are called to be light, so it kind of was fitting and, and perfect there. Well, I'd like to share with you a sermon today that I think is really important. I mean, every sermon we give is important um, and absolutely necessary for all of us. It's a, it's a topic that we all need, and if we're going, you know, if we're going to be in God's kingdom. We've had some things, you know, we've, we hear this over and over again, but I want to I wa I just bring out this little certain topic, this one little word. Did you know, maybe Chuck knew this, because Chuck is in the weather and also science, that a hurricane lifts 60 million or more tons of water and generates more power every 10 seconds than all the electrical power used in the United States in one year. I will read that again because I was kind of astonished to read that fact myself. A hurricane lifts 60 million or more tons of water and it generates more power every 10 seconds than all the electrical power used in the United States for that one year. A hurricane that struck Bangladesh back in 1970 produced a tidal wave which killed at least half a million people, 500,000 people. In, the 19, in 1900, in Galveston, Texas, a hurricane created a storm tides that swept 6,000 people to their deaths. So that is talking about a whole lot of power. That is pretty awesome power, and of course that is God's power, because He controls what goes on in the, you know, in the atmosphere, in the, in the weather patterns. Here's another quote for you. This was uh, several years ago. A senator stated that H-bombs could blow the earth off its axis by 16 degrees. Scientists correctly say not so. There is no known power in nature which could so upset the earth. But a strong earthquake involves almost as much energy as would be supplied by, get this, a million atomic bombs or 1,000 H-bombs set off simultaneously. That's, that's, that came, comes from the Department of Defense. And of course, we know that earthquakes are under God's control. And you talk about power when you just try to think about that. I mean, we see the divination of one of those bombs. You think about what they say, would you know, the, the energy in an earthquake, the energies in hurricanes. That's a lot of power. We as human beings, we look for power, don't we? Young people want powerful cars. Maybe we all want powerful cars. That you know, when you hit the gas, that you know, that engine revs up, and you know, you know, you want that real power. Power is something we all look and we look at and we see, whether it's you know, in our personal lives, whether our job, status, whatever it may be. Power is something people want, and power is something that people can have in their lives. I want to read a few quotes to you about power. If you haven't gotten the drift of my sermon today, it's on power. Power may justly be compared to a great river. While kept within its bounds, it is both beautiful and useful. But when it overflows its banks, it is then too powerful or, you know, relentless to be controlled. It bears down on all before it and brings destruction and desolation wherever it comes. That was said by Andrew Hamilton back in 1741. And it's true, it's fitting to, the, to power. When power is kept in check, it is good. But if it goes unchecked, it causes problems. Another interesting one is way back from 569 BC, they think. I can't even say that the name Epi Epidicus. I don't know who Epidicus is, but I'm sure he was somebody that lived back in 569 BC. And he said, the measure of a man is what he does with power. There's another quote here by James Burns. He said, power intoxicates men. When a man is intoxicated by alcohol, he can recover. 
When intoxicated by power, he seldom recovers. And here's another quote by George Bernard Shaw. He said, power does not corrupt men, but fools. If they get into a position of power, corrupt power. And here's one more. Power undirected by a high purpose spells calamity. And that was said by Theodore Roosevelt. And high purpose by itself is utterly useless if the power puts into power put into it is lacking. So in other words, if you don't have directed power, if it is useless, you know, keep in the right perspective and use that power to serve maybe the everlasting God. You ever think about that? Using our power for that purpose, a higher purpose? We're going to start off in Matthew chapter 6 today. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. We'll see if technology will be on my side today. Matthew chapter 6 is a prayer that so many people pray all over the world, and yet I wonder how many Christians that is. I wonder how many really realize what they pray for. Matthew chapter 6, 13. Verse 13, Jesus Christ said we should pray for this, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I said that word in there, didn't I? I said that word power. God's kingdom is a kingdom of power. If we're going to be in that kingdom, we are going to need to have that power. Tap into it, and yes, and use it. Jesus Christ had power. After he had been tempted by Satan the devil, after he'd been tried and tested. Notice in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 14 says, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. God's Spirit is a spirit of power, as we have heard. So as I said, you know where we're going today with the sermon. Let's focus on the word power. And see why we need power in our lives. And what that power can do for us in our lives. And why we desperately need it in our lives. Verse 14 it says, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And news of him went out through all the surrounding region. Let's turn over a few pages and go to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Here we, we, we read, and you know, what were the disciples supposed to wait for? Here it was on the day of Pentecost. What were they supposed to wait for? Luke 24, verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Endued with power from on high. His disciples were told, you wait. You know, don't go anywhere. Don't fail to show up. When we read in the account in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, there was a lot of noise in the room, you know. But it wasn't from tambourines. It wasn't from rock and band. It wasn't from people saying amen or hallelujah over and over. It was from God. It was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. And upon each of those disciples sat like a flame of fire. And they began to speak with languages who were known to all those people who had traveled from various parts of the world, you know, who came to Jerusalem to observe the Feast of Weeks, for the Feast of Pentecost and the Feast of the First Fruits. Those disciples spoke so convictingly and so powerfully that thousands were baptized, were converted, were turned to God that day. They said, these men aren't drunk. You know, do you think these men are drunk because they are up here speaking in these unknown languages, unknown to different ones? Actually, they were known by all of them. You talk about a miracle. You talk about power. Today I'm going to read a few of these scriptures that we go through from the Message Version. And I'd like to read this one from the Message Version. Scroll down, Luke 24, verse 49 here from the Message Version. Let me find it real quick. He says, you know, you're the witnesses that comes next is very important. I am sending what my Father promised you. So stay here in the city until he arrives, until you're equipped with power from on high. So equipped. I think a Ghostbuster for some reason. I don't know why. They had the backpacks. They were equipped. They had power. I don't know why that came into my head. You know what is interesting about all three of those verses? Well, the word power. 
comes from a Greek word that I can say, dunamis. <laughs> D-U-N-A-M-I-S, from which the word dynamite comes from. Dunamis, that's how I'm going to say it. Most of the scriptures I'm going to give you today come from the Greek word dunamis. Write that word down. It is used 112 times in the Bible. It is translated various ways, such as mighty works, mighty deeds, might, mightily, workers of miracles, virtue, strength, miracle, ability, abundance, and power. The English word dynamite, dynamic, comes from the word dunamis. And you'll be, it's kind of cool once we plug that word into a few of these scriptures that we go through, how it changes and makes them, I don't know, puts a little emphasis on this, on this word. God wants us to have dynamis, power. He wants us, he, you know, he doesn't want us to just say dynamite. He doesn't want us to just be, you know, like kid dynamite. <laughs> he wants us to have dynamite. But it is that spiritual dynamite, not physical. You can't buy this. God will give it to us, and it is a power that comes from Him, and it is a power that generates in us that spiritual strength and help that we need to be able to win the battles of life. Power is a force that all Christians need. Yes, not only need, but they must have in their lives. Acts chapter 1. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. As the disciples were waiting in Jerusalem, we read that, you know, what Luke wrote. He said, but you shall receive power. Did you receive power when the Spirit of God came upon you when you were baptized? Had the laying on of hands? Did you receive power? Yes. Yes, you did. What are we doing with that power that we received? Verse 8, Acts 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Not just locally, not just for those disciples back then, because they did, they did not you know, go to the uttermost parts of the earth per se, but who can go to the uttermost parts of the earth today, doing the work of God? He says, I will give you power to do it. That is the word dunamis. Think about how we can reach the ends of the earth today. We're doing it right now. We're live streaming. Anybody in this earth that has internet, has that ability, can tune into us and we can reach all over this earth. We can preach God's word all over. Luke chapter 9. We're probably, we're going to come back to Acts, I believe. Luke's chap, Luke chapter 9. You don't have to turn there if you don't like, if you, if, you, if you don't wish. But Jesus Christ sent the disciples out. They had power. And then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power, dunamis, and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Power to cure the sick. Power to heal. It's pretty awesome. He said, I'm going to give you this, you know, this to you as a special benefit. They weren't baptized yet, but I'm going to give you that power to go out and do my job. To what he says there. Let's let's do turn to Hebrews chapter six. Hebrews chapter six. Just establishing that God has power to give and we have power available. He talks about those who turn away. And he says in verse four. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, in verse 5, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Those have tasted, you know, we, we, are, we know, we see, we're tasting the powers of the age that is to come. They've actually tasted the powers of God by having the Holy Spirit. The same word there, dunamis. They tasted of it. They had it. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, familiar scripture. Very familiar. No need to turn there, too, if you don't, if you, if you don't, if you, if you, you so choose not to. That word power, dunamis, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of dunamis, of dynamite, and of love, and of a sound mind. 
as we will see, that power is so vitally needed for us to be able to live this Christian life, to be able to tap into it, to use it, because we have it, to be able to battle and overcome any difficulties that we may face in life. I want to read you a couple of, of things in nature. I think you'll like these just about the power that is available, even in nature. This is pretty cool. Did you know that the Arctic Tern, Arctic Tern, I believe I'm saying that right, T-E-R-N, is a long-winged swimming bird with a 15-inch body, and it performs an incredible feat each year. See, if you remember and, and know what this is, I had no clue until I ran across this. The amazing bird migrates from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back every year. A flight of 20,000 miles. Now, as far as I know, it has no cargo bay in its body to be able to carry a lot of supplies. As far as I know, it carries no first aid equipment with it. Those birds on the west coast simply fly down the coast of North and South America. Those on the east coast, though, perform a Herculean hop <laughs> across the Atlantic, and then they proceed south along the west coast of Europe and Africa. Their flight south begins in September, and then in the spring the direction is reversed. It is a very difficult flight, but apparently it's very good exercise for them. 20,000 miles, and they live a long life. One that was, uh, that was banded and tracked, one of these Arctic terns, lived a documented 27 years. Probably you have to live a long time if you can fly 20,000 miles twice a year. I want to read you another one of God's power. The biggest locust swarm, the greatest swarm of, uh, of desert locusts ever recorded, was one covering an estimated 2,000 square miles. Think of that, 2,000 square miles. I, I, I was going to draw a comparison and I didn't have time. But 2,000 square miles, that's a, long, that's a large area. And it was observed crossing the Red Sea in 1889. Such a swarm of locusts must have contained, they've estimated, about 250 billion insects, weighing 500,000 tons. Amazing, the power just in nature. And there's so many more, so many more examples, but I thought those, those two were, pr were pretty neat to pull out. The power of God is there, is shown, is known. God is called, you know, um, God Almighty. <laughs> Jesus Christ said all power was given to him. It is a different word, by the way, and I'll cover that in, in, the, uh, uh, in Matthew 28. It means all authority. He has authority to give power. He has authority to, to give it. The word dunamis is the one that is most used. Dunamis is the one that is used most in the Bible. Let's take a look then why we need God's power in our lives, why we need it and why we must have it. First of all, we need God's power to live life. You and I cannot live life the way we need to and the way we ought to without the power of God. We know without God, we can't do anything. Jesus Christ himself even said, of my own self, I can do nothing. Now, if the Son of God, incarnate in the flesh, would say, of my own self, I can do nothing, how much can we do of our own selves? Not only physically, but how much can we do spiritually? We need the power of God. So we need the power of God in our life. I'd like to share with you several areas of life in which we desperately need to use the power of God. 2 Corinthians 13. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 13. We need to call on God. You know, please give me that power. Please give me that strength. Please you know, enliven me and strengthen me, enable me, empower me to be able to live your way of life. 2 Corinthians 13, 4, For though he was crucified in weakness, yet lives by the power of God. Jesus Christ was able to live by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him. How? How do we walk with him? How do we live with him now? Not only in the kingdom of God, how do we live with him now? by the power of God toward you. I want to read this from the message version. Let me see if I can find it. My message version isn't labeled every scripture, so I got to weed through and figure out where I start from. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 4 from the message version. 
Uh, we're just going to break in. It says, now preparing for the third, I'm saying it again from a distance. If you haven't changed your ways by the time I get there, look out. You who have been demanding proof that Christ speaks through me will get, will get more than you bargained for. You get the full force of Christ. Don't think you won't. He was sheer weakness and humiliation when he was killed. But, oh, he's alive now in the mighty power of God. We weren't much to look at either when we were humiliated among you. But when we deal with you this next time, we'll be alive in Christ, strengthened by God. So again, power, word power, the dunamis. We need the dynamite of God in our lives to be able to just live life, to, to exert force, to live and to enjoy life. With all the negativity about us, we have to be able to ward that off and to fight off with the power of God, to stay on that straight and that narrow path when, we, you know, when there are so many alternate paths to be able to go and there are so many route, uh, you know, routes out there that they're able to travel and that will take us off our course and get us off track. And of course, you know, those aren't the straight and narrow paths, are they? It takes power to walk down the straight and the narrow path. It takes the strength from God, the might that God will give us just to live life. We need that power to grow. The second area that we need, that to grow in godliness. We need that power. Romans 15. Let's go to Romans 15. You see, plants need power to grow. So do humans. Plants, you put them in the ground, and all of a sudden you see them growing. You see them coming up. You see them, you know, have a garden every year. And you can start, I know Karen has a garden every year too, starts off in the greenhouse. And you start off with a seed. You start off with dirt, there's nothing. And then you see them grow. You see them grow bigger and bigger, and then they produce their fruit. Half of my tomatoes, my grape tomatoes did great. My other tomatoes, not so much this year. The green beans, same thing, from a seed to grow up in a plant, to bear, to bear fruit, to bear more vegetables, to more, more beans. It is amazing how much they can grow and how much you can learn from that. But we need the power of God in order to grow ourselves. Romans 15, verse 13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we can live life in a way that is joyful and we can have that peace and believing. The message version says, Oh, may the God of green hope fill you with joy, fill you with peace, so that your believing lives, filled with the life-giving energy of the Holy Spirit, will brim over with hope. So there they called it life-giving energy. We need to grow. Have that life-giving energy that is you know, from the Holy Spirit. How can we live that type of life? How can we walk in that way except we have the power of God? The power to bear godly fruit. In verse 19 of that same chapter says, "...in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about..." You know, I can't say that, that place. "...I have fully preached the gospel of Christ." Why can't they just, you know, city A and city B, but they've got to put these weird words in here that I can't read. <laughs> To be able to grow, to be able to walk forward, to be able to move, to be able to bear the godly fruit that, that we need, we need the power of God. We need that strength. And of course, Galatians 5.22 talks about the fruit that we bear. And I'm not going to turn there, but how do we bear that fruit? How does your plant grow? Which fruits are lacking? Which fruits are thriving in our lives? I don't think we all produce all of them in the exact same amount. And I think some produce more, you know, more of one than the others. We all need to be producing them, though. And how do you do that? With the power of God. What about overcoming? Number three we can cover. What about strength to master our shortcomings? To make repentance complete? To be able to turn it around? How do people change? Sometimes we look back in our lives and we say, I used to be that way. I don't even like that way anymore. <laughs> that is where I used to be. How did you make that change? What miracle took place in your life? How did you make the change, you know? The power of God came into it and gave you power to change. To turn from being one way to turn to being God's way. 
That didn't just happen by accident. It didn't happen by force, you know, of your will. It happened by the power of God, the power and the grace and the love of God. You had to be willing, but the power of God is the strength that we need to grow. Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verse 12. There is no dunamis here. <laughs> there was dunamis in the previous scripture, but both power and might. But in this one, this one uses the example of the greatest power we could ever have, and that is God Almighty Himself. Philippians 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, you see one of the hallmarks of God's church, one of the hallmarks of the, the people of God is that they obey. As you have always obeyed, we just take it for granted. God's people follow orders. God's people follow what they are asked to do. It is a hallmark. They obey God. God says, do it. They do it. We should. As you have always obeyed, not as, not as in my presence only, so not just because somebody is around and might tell you whether somebody is around or not, but, rather, but, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Here's what it says from the message version. It says, What I'm getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep on doing what you've done from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. That energy is God's energy, an energy deep within you. God himself willing and working at what will give him the most pleasure. So here again, we run across the word energy, power. What do you do when no one's around? How do you live your life? How do you have strength? What do you, what do you get into when nobody is looking? It is nice to be together with everyone, isn't it? Able to share with each other. We're able to sit and talk and visit with people you haven't seen for a while, isn't it? You're able to encourage everyone, lift up each other. What do you do when you're all by yourself, though? You know, we only see each other once a week sometimes. The feast is so much fun, we get to bother everybody for eight days straight. It's so much fun. So much energy, so much power that you can feel. The Holy Spirit is there. God's people are there. But what do you do when you're all by yourself? You have the help from God when you're by yourself. We're talking about it today. The dunamis. The power of God to be able to strengthen you and help you to stand. Temptations to sin ramps up when you're all alone. Satan thinks he's got you cornered. He's got you right where he wants you because you've got no help, you know, but you do. But you do have help. The Holy Spirit within has the power, the energy. Continuing verse 13, For it is God who works in you. Now you talk about power, the power of hurricanes, the power of the Arctic turn, the fly, the power of the locust. That all comes from God, and God is with you. For it is God who works in you. You talk about power. That is almighty power that works in you. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. To lead us to do the things that please Him. To lead us to do the things that make us walk in the right paths. So we need power to grow, power to overcome. third one was overcome. The fourth one is, we need power to resist. Power for resistance. We need to resist the wrong thoughts. We need to resist the world. We need to resist Satan and the devil. And we need to resist our own self-urges. We are our own worst enemy. <laughs> we go it alone. We try it alone. We get ourselves in trouble when we do that because Satan knows he's got us again cornered when we try to go alone and do it ourselves. We and our own lust of the eyes and the flesh, our own thoughts. But we need to resist. And how do we do that? You may know counselors, they say, you know, you don't have, to, you don't have anything to resist. Just do it. 
You know, do what you want to do. Do what makes you feel good. Isn't that society today? Just don't hurt anybody. How do you know if you don't follow the Ten Commandments? If you don't follow those Ten Commandments, you do hurt people. You hurt two people. Two people in the sense of two individuals. One is God and one is your fellow man. And you're going to hurt them if you just do what comes natural, if you do what you want to do. And thinking about you and, you know, and everything is for you. Notice I didn't say some things you know, are for you. I said everything is for you. That's how people think. Society thinks. It is about how you can get ahead and how you can take advantage of others. It is not about others. And I, th you know, I thought it was interesting. We, we talk about perfect love casting out all fear. You know how perfect love casts out fear? Because when you have fear, who are you thinking about? You. Fear is incoming. Love is outgoing. And when you're thinking about you, you can be afraid. When you have an outgoing concern, then you dispel those fears because love does cast out those fears. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. When the wrong thought comes in, how do you control it? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. When well, the wrong thought comes in, how do you control it? What do you do with it? You know, sometimes a crazy thought will come into your head. What? <laughs> what? Crazy thoughts come into your head. Where did that come from? Get out of here, you say. You know, I don't want you to think that way. It isn't a sin. Sin starts with a lust. Sin starts when that comes into your ear, goes up to your brain, and you say, Oh, that is an interesting thought. And you start thinking it through, and you're you know, starting you know, to let it work within you. What you do is when it comes into the ear and it goes up into the brain, you say, hey, wait a minute now. That doesn't belong here. Get out. And you dynamite it out of your head. I don't, you know, you don't blow yourself up, but you dynamite it out. We're talking about that power. You use the power of God. You dynamite it out. You get rid of it. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. How do you resist? How are you able to fight back? Verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty. Notice that word mighty is dunamis. Powerful. Dynamite. In God. How do you do that? How do you resist? Dynamite. Mighty. In God. For pulling down strongholds. Verse 5, he says, Casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I'm going to read this from the message version. The world is unprincipled. <laughs> it's dog eat dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair, but we don't live or fight our battles that way. Never have and never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for demolishing that entire massively corrupt culture. We use our powerful God tools, oh, there's that word, powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers er erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity. So now we circled right back around that to the growing part again. Catch that at the end? For building lies of obedience into maturity. Implying that we are growing. And again, with the power of God to be able to do all that. The power that is in each and every one of us. How do we do that? Most people don't. One of the greatest reasons is so that they can have a sound mind. I mean, some of the craziest things I hear happening on the news, I say, <laughs> I just say what? Every day it's something new, and you just think, what? The, just the blatant disrespect and just the mindset out there. You can't believe some of the things. It's not a sound mind, and the world needs soundness of mind. And you have the opportunity. You have that availability. I do too, through the power of the Holy Spirit that can transform our minds, that can change us. And you see the greatest part of a baptism is not what sins did you commit. 
It is what is your attitude towards sin and what is your attitude towards God now? You know, I'm sorry, forgive me, baptism. And now I'm going to be like you, my Father in heaven. I can't do it by myself. I need the power of God and of Jesus Christ who walked this earth, couldn't do it on his own power. How much can you and I do on our own power? We need the power of God. We need the dynamite. We need the dunamis, the power and strength that comes from him. That's how we can resist and overcome and change and grow the things that we've covered. To fight our enemies, we need that dynamite. Another reason we need power in our life is for endurance. To be able to endure to the end, it's a, it's a long journey, isn't it? Some have just started out in the journey, fresh baptisms. You know, I can think of a few that were freshly baptized over the last year, just starting out. Others have been on this journey for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years maybe out there. It can get weary, that road. Power to endure trials that come, health difficulties that come. And how do we? The power of God. You know, I always marvel at the people. You remember I, I brought up a story seven, eight years ago now of Mary. Remember Mary? She had cancer, the young girl. I checked in on her about a month or so ago. She's still doing great. But uh, I marvel at people with her attitude and her um, and her mindset to go through the trials that she go, went through and to still have a positive attitude. And she was very, she still very is, very religious. And everything was God's will. I know of a, I know of a, of a teacher here in the Vandercook School District. You know, we, we prayed for her, her daughter that was killed, uh, you know, half a year ago or so. Um, uh, it's almost a year ago now. And this is the complete mindset. And those, I marvel at those people that have that power within them. And all those, those that are on our prayer list even. You know, it was, I remember when I broke my leg, certainly after that was the, the story of the young lady down in Australia that had the horse trailer fall on her. You know, and her attitude that she had. I marvel at that because that's God's power within those people. Whether they're called or not, you can see the power. The power of God to give us strength to be able to endure no matter the trial. Whatever our trials, we have power to be able to deal with it. When you feel like giving up, when you need to reach out, when you need to have strength and help, God will be there to help us and strengthen us through. I just, I think we forget that. I think we make our problems bigger than God, but God is there. Philippians 4. Philippians 4, verse 13 is a beautiful scripture and a very familiar verse. Loads of dunamis in here. <laughs> I'm glad this was, you know, this it was, you know, this is powerful because I really like it. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me, I changed the word, dynamite. <laughs> the word strengthens comes from the word dunamis. It is actually, uh, you know, means to empower. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the power, who empowers me to do it. Do you notice the emphasis in that scripture? We have power in our lives, but it is not on our own power. It is not some, you know, V8 engine <laughs> powering us, not the juice or car. V8 gives us power too, and it is pretty delicious. I do like it. But we're talking about the power that comes from God. I do. The power that God has to deliver. Let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know that? Uh, you know what I like ab about that? It is an I can do attitude. I can, I can do, you know. I can do it through Christ. I can do it through Jesus Christ who strengthens, who strengthens me. He is the one who gives us the power and the might to do it. 1 Peter 1, beginning verse 3. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Wow, wonderful goal that God has for all of us. How can we make it? Verse 5, who are kept, how are we going to make it? How are we going to endure to receive that wonderful reward? Who are kept by the power of God, by the dunamis, kept by the power of God. How can you make it? How can you last the trials and the difficulties that come our way, the journey that is set before us? How can you make it through? Dynamis. Dynamite. It is, absolute, it is available, but just like dynamite, it must be set off right. That is where the stirring up comes in. That is where the asking God for help and strength to help us through situations. And when you look back on, you know, how did I ever make it through that, you know, through that, 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 that difficulty, that trial? I don't, you know, I don't know how I made it through. Now you look back and you say, that wasn't so hard because your spiritual muscles are bigger, you know, than they once were. I'm sure each and every one of us can look back at the trials in our lives and think, how did we make it through that? I've talked about it before. I thought my divorce was... was was going to destroy me, but I can stand here and tell you it was actually a blessing in my life. I'm kind of weird, like I've said, to say that. And the same with my the same with my leg. Just like all of you have points in your lives that you can look back and and, and you know you know you wonder how did you make it through. When I broke my leg, I know that brought me closer to God than I ever thought it would. <laughs> Never thought you could get closer, you know until something like that happens. So we need it for endurance. We need it for life, for growth, overcome, resistance, endurance. We also need it for unity, this power. The power of God can unify, not blow apart, but blow together, <laughs> if that's possible. God's people, you know, instead of blowing them apart by resisting that which could pull you away and separate, you know, and, and by, and, and, uh, and separate us, but by helping us to be together. It takes God's Spirit and the power of that Spirit to remain unified. It's real easy to break off. It is more difficult to see good and stay together. Lots of people break off. Ephesians 4. Let's go to Ephesians 4. You can look back and see the people that have broke off. The sense of power is here, but it does not use the word power, but it uses the word Holy Spirit, which we know makes available the power of God. Ephesians 4, verse 1, it says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the vocation with which you were called. You know, it is interesting that God doesn't call it a hobby. He doesn't say, you know what, that little side thing that you do, religious once a week, you know, whether it's, you know, Saturday mor Saturday afternoon, Saturdays, you know, mornings, whatever you do for the world, you know, Sunday. <laughs> and for us, Sabbath, you know, that little thing that you do once a week, don't worry about that too much. You know, he didn't call it that. He calls it a vocation. Our job is being a Christian. Our job is living God's way of life. It's not something that we do when we just have time for it. Oh, you know, I think I'll, I'll be good today. I'll follow those commandments today. That's not what it is. It's our job. Our job is showing the world around us and everybody we come in contact with that we are Christian. Did you catch that? Showing the world around us and everybody we come in contact with. That's hard sometimes, isn't it? How many of us have dealt with a real, you know, somebody that's hard to deal with? We may say something. I always talk about road rage, you know, somebody cutting you off. And I don't know if it's just this COVID thing, but I have seen more people running more red lights, especially when I leave a certain spot where I work at our fairgrounds, where our office is now. Coming out of that, I have, I tell you what, if I, I've got to sit there. More people running red lights. 
But I mean, the road rage, though. I mean, and people getting mad at grocery stores or, you know, just all the stuff. And Facebook, oh, social media, social media. Man, that's just as much as talking to somebody in person. But the things I see on social media, holy cow. It is our job to be a Christian in everything we do, every aspect of our lives, in showing the world around us and everybody we come in contact with that we are Christian, that we are God's children, that we know the right way to live and we have the power to be able to do that. It's so easy. Remember, we talked about paths earlier in the sermon. It's so easy to go down that path to the right or to the left, those different routes that are there. It takes power to stay on the straight and narrow. We said we would stay on the straight and narrow. And we're learning and we're growing. See how all of it ties together? It all ties together. So he says, walk worthy of the vocation with which you were called. Verse 2, with all lowliness and gentleness. See, we recognize who the power comes from, from God. With long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Verse 3, enduring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. How do you struggle to keep the unity in the bond of peace? Only through the power of God. Without that power, we, we won't achieve it. Let's, you know, let's be able to see beyond our own, our own needs, beyond our own desires, our own wants and our own views to say, I want to do things for the betterment of everyone. It's hard for society because it's a very me, myself, and I society that can creep into the, to even our lives. We're all guilty of it, too, from time to time. But we want to say that we want to do things for the betterment of everyone. That is what it's about. Verse 4, there is, only, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. And let's jump down to verse 14. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Remember, we talked about growing. By the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Pop quiz, how do we do that? <laughs> how do you become like Christ? How do you grow up to Christ? The Holy Spirit, the power of God. The power of God unifies, doesn't blow apart. The power of God strengthens us to live right, so unity we need the Spirit of God. We need the power of God. You know why else we need the power of God? To do greater works. Jesus Christ said, you will do greater works than I do. When I leave, you are going to do greater works. Now you say, how can you do greater works? Anybody raise the dead recently? No. Anybody walk on water? Anybody feed 4,000 with a few loaves of bread and a few fish? No. How about thousands converted? How about, you know, how about thousands of people converted? How about preaching the gospel with power to, to a world through the written word, through internet? You talk about power, that is available to do it. Mentioned that earlier. That is available for us to do it now. Talk about greater works. How can you do greater works than Jesus Christ ever did? Go to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. What are you talking about, Josh? Acts chapter 6. Stephen knew how. Stephen was willing to put his life on the line because he knew that. I love reading the book of Acts because you get to see how real Christians did things in the early days. You see how they react and how they acted. Acts chapter 6, verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, dynamis, same word, Stephen had dynamite. He was a dynamite man. <laughs> Stephen, full of faith and dynamite power, did great wonders and signs among the people. I think of Wreck-It Ralph there, you know, dynamite gal, remember? Wreck-It, or uh, Fix-It Felix, dynamite gal. He was a dynamite man. Message version reads it like this. Stephen, brimming with God's grace and energy. Oh, I love that word. There's that word again, energy. 
was doing wonderful things among the people, unmistakable signs that God was among them. But then some men from the meeting place whose member, who membership was made up of, of freed slaves, Syrians, Alexandrians, something else, and some others um, went up against him trying to argue him down. But they were no match for his wisdom and spirit when he spoke. How can we do greater works? Power available through the Holy Spirit received at baptism when we answered the call that we would follow God and do His will. Stirring it up. You can't just have it. You can have lots of dynamite sitting around, but if you don't know how to use it, it's not going to work. You have to know how to use it. We need to know how to use the power of God, and we need the power of God. Let's notice Acts chapter 4. Let's back up to Acts chapter 4. Think about the disciples back at that time. Here's, a, here's, here's Dunamis again. And with great power, Dunamis, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There's a great power in the church. There's a great power in the church today. Power available. It comes from God to his people. Power for each of us to tap into. Power for us to do greater works. To set an example in a world that is going in the wrong direction. Preaching the gospel, preaching God to the world that has not heard the true gospel. Helping turn people to God. Telling them the right way to go instead of the wrong way to go. It takes power. It takes power to do it and the miracles that God will do with that power. Finally, we need the power of God if we are going to be in the resurrection. I gave up on the numbers. I don't know where I'm at. Six, seven, I'm somewhere in there. But we need the power of God to change us from physical to spiritual. Anybody seen anybody change lately? <laughs> Nobody has. What will that be like? We all imagine it. I've read where people said, you know, well, I don't know a foreign language. I guess when I'm in the kingdom, I'm going to have to learn foreign languages. I'll have to go to school to learn it. Where that came from, I don't know. But you know what? When you are a spirit being, you are not going to have the limitations of the human mind. Crazy, huh? Just to imagine, to think about what it's going to be like. You're going to have God mind. <laughs> God is going to change us. What is that going to be like? I have no idea. I only try to picture it, and it is crazy when you try to picture it. We're limited. Anyone like Superman? I know Chuck does. He's not raising his hand, but I know he does. Maybe, maybe another superhero, maybe Batman. We're going to be Superman and Superwomen, <laughs> and that is awesome. We're going to be Superman and Superwomen in the world tomorrow. We won't be limited. Again, what's it going to be like? It takes the power of God to change us. Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3. This is Dunamis right here that we're going to read. Notice what the Apostle Paul said. What did he look forward to? What did he long for? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. It is going to take the dynamite of God to change us from physical to spiritual. From a physical human being to divine. To being a child in the very family of God. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. But it is going to take that power of the resurrection. Let's read the message version. Let me find. 
It says, because of Christ, yes, all things I once thought were so important are gone from my life compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ, Jesus Christ as my master firsthand. Everything I once thought I had going for me is insufficient. Doggone. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could... I'm not even at the right spot. Yeah, I am. I don't even know where I'm at anymore. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by Him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting God, God's righteousness. In verse 10, I gave up that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experience His resurrection power, be a partner in His suffering, and go all the way with Him to death itself. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Another dynamite for us to be in His kingdom. Talking about various bodies, He talks about the resurrection of the dead. Sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. Verse 42. But now we're going to pick it up in verse 43. It says, It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. How many of us have strength of and by ourselves? Not many mighty, not many noble are called by God has chosen the weak of the world, the base things, to confound the mighty. It is sown in weakness, but what it is raised in? Power. God, with the power that is His, with the dynamite that He has, is going to rocket us from the dead to an in instantaneous change to eternal life. What a tremendous blessing. What an honor. What a privilege to affect the change from human to divine. The power of God. So let's start to wrap this up. We've seen the power that is available to us, absolutely necessary for us to have, for us to be able to live life, to grow, to overcome, to resist, to endure, to be unified, to greater works, and to be resurrected. We need the power of God. Revelation 3 Revelation 3 describes the church. Just a couple more scriptures here. Jesus Christ said to the church in Revelation 3, verse 8, says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little dynamite. That's why I'm going to put that word in there. You have a little dynamite, but guess who can give you more? God. You have a little dynamite, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Jesus Christ called the church a little flock. They were not greater in number, but they were full of power and might because they can have that power from God. Their strength can come from God. Read from the message version. Verse 8, it says, I see what you've done. Now see what I've done. I've opened a door before you that no one can slam shut. You don't have much strength. I know that. You used what you had to keep my word. You didn't deny me when times were rough. I want to read you a quote. I like this one written um, somewhere around 1729 or so, they say. Somewhere in that, you know, 1729 to... Uh, um, but it says that even weak men, when unified, are powerful. We have a little strength. You have not denied my name. You have kept my word. God will make sure we do the job. I will keep those doors open for you and I will let you do the job of preaching that gospel, sending it out as a witness to the world. What great power. Let's go to Micah chapter 3. Micah chapter 3. I've stayed in the New Testament for most of the time, well, the whole time, because I wanted to emphasize that word dynamis, and I hope I did. I hope I beat it to death, that it's in your brain. But it is interesting. You could do a study, and you can find that the word uh, coach, actually, K-O-A-C-H, in the Hebrew, is translated to dynamis. 
Micah was able to say this amidst uh, a lot of difficulties that he was preaching about. He was able to say this right in the midst of all those um, declarations that he was making. He knew the source of his strength, why he could stand up and tell the nation that they needed to repent and change. And he said in Micah, Micah chapter 3, verse 8, But truly, I am full of power, coach, right there, equal to Dunamis in the New Testament. Truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgressions and to Israel his sin. Let me see if I can find that here in the message version. We can read that real quick. It says this, it says, But me, I'm filled with God's power, filled with God's spirit of justice and strength, ready to confront Jacob's crime and Israel's sin. So pretty much the same thing. How can we do the job? How can we have the strength that we need? We can be full of power. Not just have it, not just have our dynamite lying around. I've got dynamite over here, you know. <laughs> Look at my shed. I've got lots and loads of it over here. But if we don't set it off and use it for good, what good is it? We have all, those of us been baptized, have received that Holy Spirit, have received the power to tap into it. Are we tapping into it? Are we using it to walk the straight and narrow, to be the light? We have dynamite in our lives. We have dynamite available to us. But if we don't use it, what good is it? Ephesians 3. Go to Ephesians 3. This is our second to last scripture. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, verse 20, a beautiful scripture. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. How is he able to do that? According to the dynamite that works in us. How is he able to do all that? By the power we have to. If we use that power in our lives, we can see God doing exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask. So it is powerful and it is so necessary. Now finally, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, this was Paul's prayer. My strong hope for us all is that we may be able to have and to use the power of God in our lives. Colossians 1 verse 9, Paul writes and he says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. In verse 11, notice, strengthened with all might. The word strengthened and might both come from that word we've talked about all day, dynamis. That we might be strengthened with all might, that we might have dynamite upon dynamite, that we might be empowered to use that dynamite according to His glorious power. Now this word, His glorious power, is a different word from dynamis, but there are several different words used. This is a different word. According to His glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. Now let's read that from the message version to bring this to a close. It says, Be assured that from the first day we heard of you, we haven't stopped praying for you, asking God to give you wise minds and spirits attuned to His will, and so acquire a thorough understanding of the ways in which God works. We pray that you'll live well for the Master, making Him proud of you as you work hard in His orchard. As you learn more and more how God works, you will learn how to do your work. We pray that you'll have the strength to stick it out over the long haul. Not the, gri not the grim strength of gritting your teeth, but the glory strength God gives. It is strength that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy. Thanking the Father who makes us strong enough to take part in everything bright and beautiful that He has for us. What a beautiful scripture. Scriptures, verse 9 through 10. Brethren, Paul's prayer for us and my prayer for you is that you might have the dynamite that God offers, but not only have it, but use it to stay on the straight and narrow. 
we will be people of power. And if we use, you know, and, and if we use to be together, to do a work, to endure, to grow, we will have it and we will be in God's kingdom because that power will finally change us from physical to spiritual. Amazing when you think about the power that we have and is available to us. So brethren, may you all have dynamite in your life.